All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Keith Green. I'm the director of Africana Studies here at Rutgers Camden. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our Black History Month 2021 kickoff. Now, after the year that we've had last year, um, it's no given that we would have had a Black History Month this year and in the shape that it's actually in. So I'm really excited that we can come together to honor the history, um, the experiences of people of African descent um, in the US and abroad um, together this evening. Now, normally we have a singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing as a portion, right, as a component of any, you know, well done Black History Month program. Um, this evening we have a special treat because the song itself will actually be the topic of conversation. And so I myself am super excited to simply have a full evening to talk about the history, the ways in which this song has been passed down from generation to generation, and even to think about its digital um, and electronic forms. Um, we have a special guest tonight. We have Dr. Sonia Donaldson, um, who will be speaking with us later on um, in the program. And so this evening um, is unique um, for the ways in which it honors our history, but also because we get a chance to really pause and think about the centrality of this song to our history, to our um, experiences. Um, at the top of the hour, I wanna thank a few people because um, if I wait till the end, I'll forget. Um, so <laughs> first off, I wanna thank um, the, all the folks that I partner with on campus to make any event possible. Um, in our Office of Web Design, we have Kate Blair and Julie Ronsinski. Some of you might have come to the program via a flyer that was made initially. Um, I want to thank the Office of Web Design for their work putting that flyer together, as well as spreading the news via Rutgers, um, various social media networks. Um, I want to thank my close collaborator, um, Dr. Rosemary Pena, um, president founder of the Black German Heritage Research Association, um, who I collaborated on for this particular project as well. Um, she, in fact, introduced me to Dr. Donaldson, and I've been able to kind of partake of Dr. Donaldson's other work in terms of Black speculative fiction. Um, we've been having an ongoing conversation um, once a month or so on um, Lovecraft Country. So um, I encourage you folks to also follow up with Dr. Donaldson with questions about that aspect of her work as well. And so I owe my knowledge of Dr. Donaldson's work and person to um, Dr. Pena. And so I wanna thank her um, as well. I also want to um, acknowledge that simply all the people um, who are behind the scenes have been sending out text messages, Facebook posts, um, various kind of social media um, announcements to make this event possible. I can't see the current um, population of the room right now, but I know at one point we had over a hundred and some people who are registered for this event this evening. And that's all in great part due to um, due to all of you. Um, now, at this point, I would like to um, offer to the mic, not sure what to call it, <laughs> the stage, <laughs> the virtual platform, right? Um, Dr. Naima Watson. Um, she is Vice Chancellor um, of Diversity, um, Inclusion, and Civic Engagement. Um, and she's been a longtime partner of Africana Studies. We've done so many collaborations together. If I try to name them or think of them all, I really would run out of time. Um, and so she has really made Black History Month a Rutgers Camden possible in lots of different ways for many, many different years. Um, but this year, she's also accepted the title of Vice Chancellor for um, Diversity and Inclusion. And we appreciate her support of the program as well as being here to offer a few remarks. So Dr. Watson, um, if you would, please, um, the mic is yours. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you so much for being here tonight. And a special thanks to, to Keith Green for his tireless efforts and leadership of the Africana Studies program. He is always a colleague I call on professionally and personally. So thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and I just wanna offer up a few remarks of, of my own thinking about Black History Month this month. Um, as a society, we're at a tipping point as it relates to, to Black people, the lives we lead, the experiences we have, and how Black history will be celebrated in the future based on what we've experienced, especially this past year. 
For decades, this month has been a place where as a nation, we celebrate and acknowledge the history and achievements of Black Americans, but this year is different. We are in the grips of a pandemic that is disproportionately impacting every aspect of the lives of Black people, oftentimes in the worst possible ways. We're in the midst of a racial reckoning that feels different this time. It feels like we are on the cusp of finally addressing the legacy and impact of white supremacy on this nation, where not just Black people are decrying injustice and putting their bodies on the line to achieve justice, but where white people and people of all ethnicities and religions and identities have enjoined in mass to speak up and speak out against systematic racism where corporations and institutions are finally seeming to put their money where their mouth is and supporting Black businesses, seeking to diversify their boards and leadership, enhancing their programming, adjusting their policies, and seeking to center anti-racism as a core part of their missions and values. It is my deepest hope that this work is not merely performative, that the statements of solidarity that we have seen and the dollars invested lead to measurable change and far reaching and long term impact. That when we all get vaccinated and we all must get vaccinated, that on the other side of this pandemic, when people can move freely and are not stuck in their homes and are back to living some semblance of a normal life, that the struggle for racial justice isn't just tossed aside like our discarded face mask, where the memory of the pandemic will remain with you, like, whew, that was a rough time, but now it's over. The road to justice is long, and we must remember this moment and keep moving forward. Yes, it is important to have a month that acknowledges and celebrates and makes visible how Black history is American history. But I want everyone to honor this month by acknowledging, supporting, celebrating, including, and making equitable the histories, experiences, and lives of Black people all the time, 365. That goes to all of us here at Rutgers University Camden. That goes to anyone who's joined us this evening who's not affiliated with our campus, 365. But for us here at Rutgers, we are about to launch our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic planning, and my hope is that everyone will participate, sharing with us what works about our university and what has not worked, where we have hurt you, where we have done wrong so that we can make it right, and that we can work together to be a more just and inclusive campus community. But before I go, thank you, Keith, for allowing me uh, to speak for a few minutes. But thank you so much to Dr. Donaldson for being here today. Um, I was sharing stories of how I love singing the Black National Anthem. I finally remember and warmly remember singing this as a kid, learning this in elementary school and singing it um, all throughout my, my um, formative years. But then it just stops. And so I'm so happy that we have Dr. Donaldson here to take us through the history, uh, the interpretations of it, and to also spend a moment kind of singing it together. So thank you, Keith. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the conversation this evening. Thank you so much, Naima, for those timely remarks. Um, really, I think that you've said it best in terms of thinking about the other side of the pandemic, right? And so we have to carry the lessons with us. Um, and certainly Black History Month is one month, 28 days, um, but Black history is relevant every single day of the year. So thank you so much, Naima, um, for making that plain, right? As they say in the church, make it plain, right? <laughs> um, we thank you for that. So as we've been discussing, um, Lift Our Voice and Sing is a central song, right, um, to the Africana experience. Um, and we would be remiss if we did not have um, an actual singing of the song, even as we discuss it. Um, for me, the song is more than simply lyrics, it's more than simply tone. It's almost a prayer, right? It's almost an, an invocation. And for me personally, it centers me. Um, it brings me in a right frame of mind when it comes to thinking about the, the legacy um, and the beauty of, of Black people. So at this point, I'm really privileged to um, bring to the platform uh, Mrs. Melinda Dean, um, longtime educator, librarian, um, mentor in the Camden City School District, um, someone who I'm privileged to also call my aunt, um, someone who I'm privileged 
to um, get book recommendations from, right? When I'm looking for what to read and what's good, I know who to go to, right? And so um, at this point, I want to um, ask her to um, come to the platform and she will um, give a rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. And although we are not physically together, um, it is our custom for folks to sing along. This is not a performance, right? It is a group endeavor. So wherever you are, um, even with your mic muted, you are free um, to also sing along, All right? Mrs. Dean, please. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path. We pray, lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our heart, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land. Thank you so much, Mrs. Dean. Um, it never fails every single time that that song gets me. And um, we're just so happy to have um, that version sung for us this night, um, a real privilege. So at this time, I'd like to have Dr. Um, Rosemary Pena um, introduce our um, speaker, our conversationalist for this evening, Dr. Sonia um, Donaldson. I should say that um, Dr. Pena um, is a graduate um, of Rutgers Camden several times over. Um, not only did she earn um, a couple different bachelor's degrees from Rutgers Camden um, in German and psychology, she also received her PhD in child studies um, just last year um, from Rutgers Camden. Um, she's the founder of the BGHRA, which stands for the Black German Research and Heritage Association. Um, we collaborate on several different projects. And right now we're working on Black Germany in particular. So for those of you who are wondering what else is happening during Black History Month, know that on February 18th at 1245, we'll also welcome Dr. Tiffany Florville, who will be talking about her work on Afro-Europe as well as Black Germany in particular. 
Um, and so at this time, I'd like to have Dr. Pena introduce um, Dr. Donaldson for our audience, please. Good evening, and thank you for that introduction, Dr. Green. It's a special treat for me to introduce you this evening to Dr. Sonia Donaldson. Sonia and I go way back, in fact, over 20 years. We became online friends in the Black German Forum I managed for over a decade before we finally met in person at our conference. She's been an inspiration and an invaluable mentor to me throughout my academic career. And I am also privileged to enjoy her support on the advisory board of the Black German Heritage and Research Association that has recently partnered with the Africana Studies here at Rutgers Camden. And I hope that all in the audience today will join us as we launch our All Black Lives Matter series on February 18th, and I'll put the registration link in the chat. The last time Sonia was introduced to members of my Rutgers Camden community was under very different circumstances as she was kind enough to attend my dissertation hearing in March 2020. So I'm delighted to now have the opportunity to elevate her timely and important work that I know has meant the world to her for a very, very long time. So after I read her short bio, the next voice you will hear is my dear friend and Black German Studies colleague, Dr. Sonia Donaldson. Sonia Donaldson is Associate Professor of English at New Jersey City University, Director of the Lee Hagen Africana Studies Center, and Coordinator of the African and African American Studies Program. In addition to her digital humanities project, Singing the Nation, Donaldson is also completing a book manuscript, Irreconcilable Differences, Memory, History, and the Echoes of Diaspora, which examines autobiographical narratives, music and performances, performances by Black writers and artists in Germany, the UK, and the US. And the US. Donaldson was a 2016 recipient of a Mellon Career Enhancement Junior Faculty Fellowship a 2019 Virginia Humanities Fellowship and Lab. Do Donaldson is also a former technology editor at Black Enterprise Magazine and completed stints at Inc. Magazine, Ziff Davis Publications, and the LA Daily News. Her scholarly work has appeared in Callaloo, The Feminist Wire, African and Black Diaspora, an International Journal, and Women, Gender, and Families of Color. Welcome, Dr. Donaldson. Thank you, Dr. Pena. Such a pleasure to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna start, um, first of all, by just saying thank you to everyone. Um, uh, who is here. I know it's the dinner hour for many. And so I appreciate you taking time out of your schedules uh, to be here. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Keith Green, who has been an amazing um, presence in some of the initiatives I've, I've sort of launched um, at NJCU. So I appreciate this collaborative energy that uh, that you bring. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually just sort of re-energized me in really important ways to do the work. Uh, Rosemary, of course, uh, 20 years and still going, and I'm actually an admirer of yours. Um, you've done tremendous work in launching or, or being the sort of foundation of a field of study. So um, I am here doing this work because of you. Um, and I know the, the labor that has gone into producing what you've produced through BGHRA. So I really appreciate that. And finally, I wanna say uh, thank you to the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Inclusion and Civic Engagement, Dr. Watson. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Melinda, Dean, Ms. Dean for your beautiful, beautiful rendition of what is probably by now my favorite song. Um, uh, and so, so, so often sometimes you hear a song over and over, you don't wanna hear it anymore. This is one of those songs that each iteration brings its own meaning um, and, and sort of shifts you in really important ways. So thank you for your um, 
your beautiful rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Um, as Rosemarie mentioned, I um, received a, a few um, fellowships, a couple that have allowed me to advance the project. Um, so part of this work is also um, included uh, in various iterations in the book project, um, as well as on the website, which you'll see later. Um, and I also want to say thank you very much to uh, someone's really important to me, and that is uh, Dr. Alex Gill, who's a digital scholarship librarian at Columbia University. Um, and I'm, that's all I'm going to say before I get into any more trouble with Alex. <laughs> um, uh, and so um, what I will do this evening is just provide you with an overview of the work uh, around the song. Um, brief historical sort of overview, not too much. What I hope will happen is that you'll have lots of questions um, for me. And so um, we can have a conversation um, about this work and sort of what it means, uh, not just to me, but um, uh, for many other people. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen if I'm allowed to. I think I'm waiting on Rosemary. Okay. Yes, you might have to activate your share screen tab. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, this is a digital humanities project that curates and examines mashups and video performances of Jane Weld James Weldon Johnson and James Rosamund Johnson's Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem, the Negro National Hymn, Hymn, and so, and the Negro National Anthems. Let me just start. There we go. Uh, so, Initially, it was written as a poem uh, that was sort of meant to that was meant to commemorate Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Uh, but uh, James Weldon Johnson and his brother uh, transformed the text to music to later honor Booker T. Washington's visit to uh, the Stanton Institute, where Johnson was the principal, and this is in Jacksonville, Florida. And so since the first rendition by a chorus of 500 school children in 1900 onto the most recent popular iterations, and many of us of course are familiar with the, the recent popular iterations, uh, uh, the song continues to resonate uh, with black Americans and in the diaspora as well, right? So whether we think about, whether we've come to the song through Beyonce's Coachella performance or Chloe and Hallie's recent sort of um, insertion of Lift Every Voice and Sing into their performance of the American National Anthem, uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing continues to resonate and have meaning for uh, black Americans. We can also think about uh, the sort of the recent um, uh, uh, proposed bill by uh, Representative uh, James Clyburn, right, to have Lift Every Voice and Sing become the official anthem uh, of the United, the USA. But as Johnson noted on hearing the children singing, um, he says, the lines of the song repay me in an elation almost of exquisite anguish, right? And so he had a very clear idea of uh, the song being not just um, something that um, was sort of um, limited, right? But that it had a certain resonant and resonance and meaning. Um, and so I wanted to play just a little bit of what Johnson sort of potentially uh, might have heard um, in that um, in those children's voices. Thank you. 
I'm going to stop uh, there. Um, so this is a 1981 performance by the Chicago Children's Choir. Um, the arrangement is, um, is, is quite well known. It's actually a Roland Carter arrangement and we can talk a little bit about that later as well. So Roland Carter's arrangement as Imani Perry uh, notes in her work um, is the arrangement that is frequently performed at sort of formal events. Um, and so it's a, it's a signature uh, sound um, uh, that, uh, that it attends to that arrangement. So Johnson, as uh, some of you or many of you might know, was a novelist, poet, songwriter, teacher, influential figure during the Harlem Renaissance, a diplomat uh, serving in the US consuls in Venezuela and, and Nicaragua, and the first African-American executive secretary of the NAACP. So he's quite a Renaissance man. Um, his brother Rosamond was a gifted composer and singer, and the brothers had a successful um, careers as songwriters and producers working with Bob Cole. And my colleague Paula Marie Seniors has written uh, quite eloquently about this um, in her book, Beyond Lift Every Voice and Sing. So the Johnson brothers uh, were uh, quite um, uh, accomplished um, in, in many arenas. So more recent work by scholars such as Imani Perry and Shauna Redman note that the song uh, note the song's significance in articulating the experiences of African Americans, their struggles, hopes, disappointments, and aspirations. So it's a song with deep resonance, and part of what Perry says constitutes a set of formal practices and rituals that have shaped Black American culture. And so I think. Keith um, attended to that quite nicely when he talked about um, having Lift Every Voice and Sing as part of our sort of formal interactions. It's a, it's a song that marks something um, in terms of a, sort of a collective, right? And a bringing together of community, right? So it's a song is important in, in, in sort of structuring as well as articulating uh, meaning in, um, in Black American lives. And Redmond notes as well the song's circulation, right, both within and outside of Black spaces um, as part of church hymnals and in translation, for example, and the impact that the song has had in those spaces. So we also see its circulation in art and books, films and music and as part of activist discourses. So the song uh, has not gone away, right? And um, so that's, I think, uh, something important. Um, you know, if you look uh, on the screen there, you'll see Spike Lee's, uh, the, the, the poster for Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. And there's a moment in that movie quite early on when we hear lift every voice and sing sort of segue into fight the power, right? And Lee has talked about that and Guthrie Ramsey has also written about um, this sort of um, demarcation of a new uh, anthem for the new generation. Um, but as we see in our current moment, right? Lift every voice and sing remains resonant even as anthems have come and gone, right? It's still, there is something within the song that still pulls, right? And still holds meaning in a particular way. Um, so how did I come to this project? And I'm gonna be a little um, brief. Uh, in 2011, I was a grad student at the University of Virginia and poet Amiri Baraka uh, was invited to UVA to speak. Um, and at the start of the program, it was uh, an observation of Martin Luther King's um, uh, birthday uh, group, Beautiful Voices, uh, Black Voices performed the first verse of the song and everyone sat down. So Barack is introduced and he approaches the podium and he sort of looks sideways and he says, you know, there's more to that song. There's a lot more. And uh, from my seat, you know, of course, of course, Amiri Baraka, there's a lot more. There are two more stanzas of this song. What does Amiri Baraka mean, right? So I was a little obnoxious in my head, but his emphasis on the more also struck me, right? And the lot more. Um, and in that emphasis, 
there seemed to be a demand, right, for something. Uh, uh, as if Baraka was saying to us, there is a more there that you also need to be engaged with, right? There's that more. Um, and I, I like this image of him as a sort of looking over at you, like, are you going to look for the more? <laughs> um, and so I started talking to friends and, and those early conversations sort of revolved around our own memories of the song, right? Growing up, um, performing it or going to events, whether it was the beauty shop opening, the barber shop opening, local community events where the song was always sung, right? We always sung the song collectively. And we sort of wondered um, why we don't sing the song anymore. And so it's kind of interesting, it's a question that sort of led me to think about, well, are there people still singing the song? Is it just us? And for me, it was a question of what Baraka calls we-ness, right? That we seem to have somehow lost through a shift um, away from um, the song. So Baraka describes the song as something that provides us with a map, a diagram, a historic journey. Um, that we might draw on for dignity and strength in our daily confrontations with racism. So in this quest for the more, um, uh, I headed where everyone goes, right? I went to Google. <laughs> and um, I started noticing, I, I initially just looked for performances, right? And started noticing that um, there were people all over the US um, and in other places who were actually um, still singing the song, right? So contrary to our own very sort of, um, sort of insular perspective, um, the song was still relevant and meaningful to other, to other, other Black folks, right? And this black, this, this we-ness is a broad spectrum of people. So each brings their own styles, their reasons for performing and creating videos, their own memories that they attach to those videos, their experiences and their histories to the song. And so, although the song is rooted in African-American experiences and cultural practices, they hold, re it holds resonance for those in the diaspora. So I started to notice that the song wasn't just being sung and it wasn't just being sung at particular um, sort of cultural events that people were actively creating, memorializing and remembering uh, through the song. So for example, when, example, when there are video mashups, what I noticed is that there is a narrative um, in which uh, each video creator sort of charts a, a path from Africa. Uh, so almost always the video begins with a map of Africa and we get the middle passage and we get transported. Um, and what we see is a sort of arc of history of black people, of Africans in, in this country, right? And so because of the time frame. Most of the videos end with Obama, <laughs> right? It's sort of like <laughs> the natural end of the journey, right? <laughs> is is the Obama presidency, and I think that that's a, a a really sort of interesting thing that's happening is that folks are also telling stories through their engagement with the with the song, and it's interesting to see that they're also tapping into a similar sort of visual archive, right? To tell the story of Africans in the Americas through this song. So I think that that's a really um, sort of important thing to think about with this project. Um, I started thinking about it less as a sort of curiosity and more of taking into account the idea or, or, or the, the reality that people take time, energy and effort to actually think about what they then create and put in this space, which is YouTube. So um, this collection that I have consists of around of 75 uh, videos. I have quite a bit more videos and even quite more material uh, to go through for the project. 
Um, so one of the, I've been sort of calling this the ephemeral archive, right? Because um, one of the things that we can think about um, is how we define ephemera, right? As something of no lasting significance. So I'm using just dictionary version uh, uh, definition here. Something meant to be discarded, but has now become a collectible. And so the central idea is that ephemera is understood as serving a limited purpose um, and they're also temporarily, temporarily and spatially uh, limited, right? Um, they're also fragile and impermanent. So those things lie at the core of how we consider, consider ephemera, right? How we conceive of such, such objects um, that they lose their materiality over time. Um, and then we're threatened with this loss. But I think if we think about ephemera in the way of Toni Morrison's work on rememory, right? Um, that it is a kind of archeological endeavor, right? Um, that functions as a way of making material, right? Black experiences, making matter out of um, what has been sort of discarded or disregarded or not made to matter. Um, so how then do we do that with a project like this? And so for me, Morrison and Baraka sort of lie at the core of this project in thinking about um, both this idea of we-ness and the idea of sort of reconstituting or remaking, uh, recomposing um, Black uh, life and Black history right, to make it matter. And I saw this in the sort of very active reconstructions that are taking place through these videos. Um, so Morrison's work on rememory and on rootedness and the investment in the labor of recovery are really central to um, my approach here. This idea then is that the history is never lost right we we can't what we can recover um uh what that looks like right reconstituted so we uh morrison makes a distinction between sort of fact and truth and so what we are sort of endeavoring to to uncover right is truth it's the truth of black life um and black histories um and, and so the fact that uh, Morrison sort of delineates that for me was an important thing uh, to think about how we develop um, or how I develop this, this project from ephemera, right? So this is where minimal computing comes in. And minimal computing, uh, uh, taking up Alex Gill's uh, injunction really is to ask myself the question, what do I need? Um, so this project started out in a different form using a different um, soft piece of software and I was frustrated. And so simply answering the question, what do I need? Sort of eliminated a lot of the angst of doing digital work for me. Um, it wasn't what do I want, of course, if you ask someone what they want, they're going to say they want the bells and the whistles and they want the things to move and they want to be interactive. Um, but it was more about asking what does the visitor or viewer need to see or hear or access or know and understand. And so starting from a different subject position um, allowed me uh, to then sort of dive into the, the project. Um, and again, this aligns with uh, Morrison's rememory and also Baraka's notion of we-ness that this gets generated and regenerated. Um, and the, the idea that the minimal is also about the communal. Um, in order to do this work, I had to ask for help, right? And so I could not do it alone. Um, and so that I think is also part of the ethics of the middle, minimal computing model. And so what does that look like? Minimal use of tools and resources. You use only what's necessary to develop and maintain the project. 
uh, simplicity and ease of use. Um, and so for folks who are intimidated or afraid, um, it's really, and I'm gonna actually show you how, how what it looks like sort of on the back end and then what the site actually looks like. Um, so again, there's a focus on that. And so for those of us who are in um, spaces where resources are limited, where time is limited, um, where uh, prospective partnerships um, um, are also limited because of service and teaching um, loads, for example. Um, and quite frankly, in many places where there isn't an interest in supporting Black digital humanities work, right? Um, so here's what it looks like. So this is where I started with paper on a wall and post-its. And so this is essentially a map. So when the project began, all of these were here. These orange post-its were here. Each orange post-it represents um, a component of the project that needed to get here in order to be made into a web page. So every element, what, whether it's thumbnails, whether it's annotations, narratives, keywords, started over here. The larger post-its are sort of post-its on structure. So whether it's uh, thematic elements, um, and then the thematic elements are broken down. Each, each of these yellow things represents a thematic element. The pink things represent the major um, uh, sort of scholars I wanted to, whose work I wanted to engage. And there's a little thing over here that fell off and these were case studies. <laughs> so the case studies sort of fell out of the picture but they might reemerge. So from that, I went to uh, Google Sheets. And so this is what, this is essentially this, right? So every, every one of the 75 videos is then placed into a spreadsheet. The narratives are here, the notes are here, uh, the identifying information is here. And then from there, we go to this. Well, first we go to GitHub and um, I learned how to use um, uh, some of these uh, tools, um, not as complicated and as, uh, you know, angsty as I thought it would be. And then we get, voila, we get the site. <laughs> magic, not really magic, it's labor. Um, and, and so that's one of the things I want to stress as well is that it is labor. And, but for me, as I worked on the project, I thought about the labor that uh, each video creator had also put in, right? And so it felt more of a collaboration with people who had produced these sort of, you know, these individual videos and perhaps had no conception of them being part of anything. Um, I felt as if I was in collaboration with them in terms of creating a conversation that included them because they had sort of helped structure that conversation. The other thing that I want to say is that one of the things that I did was that I allowed for absences and erasures. So when someone sets their video to private, for example, or when a video is removed as one of my central <laughs> videos uh, was for, um, um, you know, uh, intellectual property uh, infringement. Um, I wanted to mark those moments of erasures and absence, right? To think about what that means in the context of archival erasures and absences and what do we, how do we sort of reconstitute? What's the archeological work then that needs to be done in order to not um, lose those stories, right? Because they're there, right? And they're, uh, so this is what you will see as part of the collection, right? 
is that the I decided to include them rather than sort of delete them and find videos that were present um, because I wanted to think about the sort of haunting of the archive right and what it might also um, reveal to us. Um, so I came across Paul Beatty's um, uh, The Sellout, which is a, a book I love. Um, but there's a moment where he says, you know, history isn't the paper it's printed on, it's memory and memory's time, emotions and song, right? History is the things that stay with you. And I keep thinking about how apropos that is for Lift Every Voice and Sing, right? It is the thing that stays with us. Uh, many anthems have come and gone, right? Whether it's like, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, fight the power, um, you know, or any other, um, you know, Kendrick Lamar's All Right, or Hell You Tombout, or any other, um, uh, right? There's a kind of resistance to erasure in the song that I think we can um, sort of uh, dig a little bit deeper into. So I'm gonna stop sharing um, and show you just what the site looks like, right? Stop sharing this and then go to the site itself. And my computer sometimes temperamental. All right, so let's do that. So this is what it looks like. Um, the welcome page. I'm going to skip ahead and go to the collection itself. Um, and I tried uh, to include a sort of really sort of wide variety. So I didn't limit the collection to celebrity performances, for example, or, or any such thing. I wanted everything from the sort of 30 second um, let me just sing a couple of a couple of lines to uh, the video mashup uh, to um, full on productions. Um, there's a sign language version of the song uh, as well. So I thought it was really important to have a variety of performances that really speak to this um, uh, uh, you know, what is that sort of at the heart of the project, right, which is the song's resonance um, and meaning um, in our lives. So this is what the collection looks like. It's a series of thumbnails. If you hover, um, each thumbnail is a performance. You can click on it and you can scroll through. Some are there, some are not. You can also search. And so let's do MLK. And so part of what happens when you when you search, uh, videos start to become associated with each other, right? Um, or And so there's I think a lot that we can do around this collection in terms of um, thinking about the relationships between the videos, what they might be telling us. Um, I'm really interested in the mashups themselves and how people are thinking about, um, sort of American history writ large and African American um, history as well. Um, I think there's a lot of work that the song does uh, for us. Um, so uh, sorry, it's uh, 
lost my screen. Yeah, so um, so that is that is the collection itself. Um, the about page tells you quite a bit about it. Um, there's a specific post on it um, as a sort of you know um, sort of more of a sort of memory reflection post about. Um, about the song itself, it's a it's a long. So one of the things about um, using um, uh, this model is that it is really focused on um, uh, writing and exhibition, right? And so it is meant to engage um, in those in those two ways. And so I'm actually gonna I'm gonna stop talking now. <laughs> so because I would love to just be in conversation um, with folks um, and any questions that you have I'm happy to you know talk through about the project well Dr. Donaldson thank you so much for just putting into context the, your work and the history of this song in, in such a beautiful way um, I want to say to folks that I'll ask a few questions um, but I also want to have a conversation with everyone that, that's here so if you have questions, um, please feel free to use two functions. One, you can put your question in the Q&A tab that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, right? You can put a question, you can pose a question there. Um, and when we get to the Q&A um, more properly, you can also use the raise your hand feature just to simply kind of jump into the conversation um, and pose your question to Dr. Donaldson um, directly. So please um, use those features um, just to join in the conversation. So again, thank you so much. I mean, I, I learned so much just kind of hearing you talk about both the history of the song as well as the way in which you've um, really kind of brought to life um, again for us through your um, digital humanities project. Um, you know that the song was first sung in 1900. And for me, that's interesting within itself. So could you maybe say a bit more about what it meant right at that time and like in American history um, for black folks in particular to kind of you know to have this song um, be written composed and sung right during that time period well it's sort of interesting because I think um, there during that period I think in those very early days it was Johnson's poetry and then set to music by his uh, brother. But between 1900 and when Johnson became the executive um, secretary of the NAACP, there is actually a lot of work that went into popularizing the song, right? And so there, there was a, a deep investment on, on Johnson's part, I think, in the circulation of, of the song. Um, I think the, the beauty of it as well, um, also, um, I think there, I, I also did some archival work around this where people were really interested in wanting to know whether it should be sung as a prayer, um, wh what sort of embodied practice this should they have as well, should they have their hands over their heart, what should they be doing, so I think the song um, was quite resonant early on. And uh, we have also Johnson, you remember uh, Johnson and his brother are both sort of, you know, um, songwriters and, 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 you know, so they were familiar with the industry, if you will, right? So they, they were also uh, familiar with notions of circulation and sort of how uh, music gets embedded into um, sort of cultural and everyday practices. Um, so there was that uh, investment. Um, and if you think about the specificities of the time in terms of the violence against African Americans, right, as well, I think that's what you were um, sort of referring to at sort of that turn of the century moment at the height of racial uh, violence against, against Black people. Um, then I think the song becomes to be sort of even more sort of resonance in terms of articulating the specificities of Black experiences in the US, right? Um, 
Uh, and I think I think it's also interesting that in many spaces, people typically sing the first verse and then that ends. And so for me, it's always been like, but there, there's more, there's more, right? I picked up that, you know, that sort of Baraka like, but there's more, there's that whole like section where it's not so cute and it's like not victorious. It's, you know, it's an articulation of the suffering and agony of black folks and sort of slogging through, right? Um, to come to where uh, we are in this moment, right? And that there's still, more to go. There's still more to be done and 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 farther to go. Um, so we typically, when we sing the song, end with the first verse, and everyone's like, "Victory is won! Yay!" <laughs> just, the rest of the song's like, "No, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. there's more, right?" And so I I always think of of that um, as um, you know like a song that was needed for the times and is needed beyond the times, is needed now, um, but needed not in the way I think, so part of a kind of resistance to um, this idea of the song be, becoming the national anthem or proposals, um, I think it's, it, you know, there's a resistance to that because of a sort of very sort of personal um, ways that it's been, um, uh, taken up by 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 African Americans, but I think part of it is also it feels a little bit like tokenism to to some, or it's it's a, more of a gesture um, than actually something meaningful to to some to some people. So mm -hmm. yeah. So you talk about the kind of resistance, right? Some resistance, probably pushback to the song, and we think about like the NAACP. And how they adopted it as a kind of official, you know, official song, which I'm sure played a huge role in terms of making the song popular and, you know, meaningful. But then folks like Marcus Garvey, right, weren't so, you know, weren't so hot on the song in some ways. And, and that probably largely kind of plays into kind of the politics of the NAACP versus Garvey. Um, could you talk about some of the early resistance to the song? And then how do you think maybe even that connects to, as you're kind of talking right now, kind of kind of current contemporary, you know, pushback? Yeah, I mean, so I think, so the UNIA song came before um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, I'm right, I think, I, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, and so I think, you know, part of, yeah, so I think part of, that was sort of you know comp, you know competing forces right and so in terms of um, sort of building um, uh, black sort of cultural or political spaces, um, I actually I actually don't know what to to say about that in terms of you know it's differences in political perspectives differences in yeah I mean. I don't really know what to say about that. Um, uh, yeah. Because I, th I think that probably, I think also what I hear you saying is that the song is also built up contradictions, right? So we think about, for instance, yeah. how it's a song in some ways, you know, written to honor Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> right? But, but, but then, right, when Booker T. Washington kind of comes in, right, they sing it for him. Um, and, and then we think about kind of the ways in which it champions overcoming and, you know, kind of fighting the struggle. But mm -hmm. then a song which also kind of really wrestles with, right, the places in which we've been hurt, right, both personally, collectively. And, and so all of that to me seems very, you know, kind of appropriate to a song which has so many different, you know, urges, so many different impulses. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think contradiction's a, a great, a great way to describe it. Um, you know, and the, there's an interesting way in which the song is also about claiming a space in this in this world, in this in this place, rather than uh, sort of looking elsewhere or back or back to right. And so, I mean, I think if we're thinking about the sort of political tensions, then that's part of it in terms of how the song orients you to place 
and what that means in terms of sort of your larger um, politics about who you are as a Black person and mm -hmm. where you belong. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely in Lift Every Voice and Sing, there is a claiming of this American space as a, as a space for Black people because of, as you noted, the, the labor um, and the sort of you know, the blood, sweat, and tears, basically, that have been put into making this, this place, right, what it, what it is, the America that it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. So, so in terms of your work with the project, you've really, you know, thought about the ways in which it's sung now, and the way it's performed now, in terms of, you know, YouTube videos, um, you can kind of Google any number of renditions, right, of, of the song. What do you think the the migration of lift every voice and sing from poem to song to kind of you know political rally and cry to right online you know platforms what what do you think that has meant for the meaning of the song the the way in which it kind of resonates what do you see in terms of patterns of, of migration there ah uh, big question <laughs> <laughs> so um the migration of the song. I, I think part of what is so appealing to the song, if I'm thinking about the digital space, I think one of the things that the multiple rendition shows is that there is something sort of embedded in the work that allows for it to be taken up in many ways, right? And I think, um, it is a song that is resonant um, across um, uh, across borders, across boundaries, right? Um, so I think that that's that's part of it. I also think that you know when I started having these conversations with my friends about why don't we sing it anymore, um, it was a weird kind of. Um, through like like bougie moment right of like oh we used to sing this and we've moved away and you know now we're all you know characters in boomerang the movie um because that's how i imagine myself a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, so it was like a weird moment of like why don't we sing this anymore and the implications right for answering that song is that we had sort of consciously moved away from singing the song, right? We'd consciously sort of moved away from or into spaces where um, the song was not, you know, sort of a big part of people's lives. I remember having an email um, conversation with someone and they said, well, we still sing it in the South. And that was an important moment for me to sort of pause and say, okay, um, so there's something that is happening in terms of sort of my cohort of folks and how we've sort of moved through the world, right? And that's sort of telling um, in, in, in some ways. Uh, so what I see happening online in terms of the videos is that people are actively engaged in making these videos. So some of the, some of the singers will, you know, post a little note that says, I meant to do this for Martin Luther King's birthday, but things were busy or, you know, better late than never, here's my videos, right? So there's a, there's a way in which they are actively engaged in the sort of signal moments of Black American life, right? And they want to commemorate uh, those moments. And so it's something for us to, to think about in terms of perhaps a broader sort of cultivation of that. Um, but yeah, there, I, I saw um, someone says, lift every voice and sing in Spanish. There are tons of, yes. <laughs> and it's probably in my, in my list somewhere. Um, if it's on YouTube, it's probably in my list somewhere. Um, but yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's, um, it's a difficult question to answer because it's, it's personal and, and it's also, 
you know, tech, you know, the way that technology gets implicated sometimes in sort of black life is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and even with the videos, I'm sort of very aware of um, like what it means to do this kind of work in terms of collecting um, these videos. Um, yeah, uh, that it's not a simple thing um, if we think about where they appear, right? So YouTube is not a neutral entity, right? Um, for example, it's a corporation and, and, you know, what are the implications of Black bodies and Black creative endeavors being, <clears throat> being sort of, you know, corralled um, in, this, in this space, right? In this corporate um, space. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and I think you, you know, you make a kind of really good move in your on the website to kind of talk about the fact that this is not something which is innocent or transparent, like the medium definitely matters. Yeah. I mean, I'm also struck by the actual name of the archive, right? So sing the nation into being. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, that really kind of, you know, it doesn't take that for granted, the fact that there is something that we can talk about as a kind of like the black nation, or we talk about kind of Black people, right? <laughs> like Black people everywhere. Think about Baraka, like SOS, like Black people everywhere or, or, or the Black nation. I mean, in what ways do you see the song actually bringing us together in terms of all our various differences, right? In terms of regionally, you know, in terms of language, in terms of, you know, just kind of other demographic markers. Like, in, in what ways do you see the song actually kind of covering over some of those differences? Mm -hmm. as well as kind of pointing out maybe some of the differences within kind of black communities. Yeah, so it's funny when um, I started working on this project, I was only looking at black women's performances mm. of Lift Every Voice and Sing. And so part of what I uh, was looking at was um, um, Farrah Griffin has this um, essay called When Melindy Sings. And so I was thinking about the context in which Black women are called to sing as a form of healing and as a form of sort of um, essentially bringing um, people together uh, during moments of contention. Um, and so that was uh, essentially, um, you know, and that is still a part of my project, right? These moments when um, you know, when there's national crisis and Black women are called in to essentially fix and heal the crisis. So I was really interested in thinking about how singing function in that regard and lift every voice and sing. So initially I did start by collecting like celebrity performances because uh, I wanted to look at Black women singing. And then that later expanded, but the idea remains, right? That what does it mean to be called into, called in this moment of crisis to, to fix nation, right? Through, through singing. Um, and so part of what I look at are the ways in which black women, when called upon to do the work, actually assert and insert their own set of politics into these performances. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, you'll get your nation, but here's what <laughs> I'm getting, right? Um, and that that's also, you know, fraught, right? Um, and so, so part of it was thinking about what is the investment in Black women's labor, right? Um, it is a deep investment in Black women's labor uh, in the service of nation building. Um, and what are the spaces um, in which Black women can assert their own set of politics, um, their own demands, right? And get sort of their own sort of satisfaction, whatever that looks like um, to them um, out of the this, this sort of insistent call. Right. So even if we think about the sort of more most recent um, NFL performance with Chloe and Hallie, right, in which they were called to sing the American National Anthem. Well, there's a moment um, in there in that singing where the tune actually shifts to lift every voice and sing. Right. So if you listen in at about 115 of that performance, you hear lift every voice and sing embedded in that in that song. Um, you know, so there are all of these ways in which I think, um, you know, 
we're invited to think about um, not just the singing, but what it means to be called to sing and singing as a form of labor and the ways that Black women leverage their, um, that labor, right, um, um, uh, for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so what you're saying, especially about the NFL, I mean, really kind of brings that point home. I mean, obviously after the NFL's many sins, I mean, Colin Kaepernick is just simply one. We could talk about concussions and <laughs> um, disparity in terms of, you know, black head coaches and the Rooney rule and, and all those things, but certainly, right, um, the way in which kind of, you know, black female bodies are kind of called to heal the nation, very much in line with the Mammy tradition, um, but also, right, so that song was meant to kind of heal, right, in, in some ways, right, kind of heal the fissures kind of within kind of the, the audience or within who's watching, right, um, this, this very public sport. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense to me. Um, I do see a question in the um, Q&A, and so I just wanted to, to share, um, and this is from um, Ruth Spencer. I understand that there is a move to change the subtitle from the Negro National Anthem to something else. Um, what do you think of this idea? And I'm not sure what the um, alternatives um, might be, but I guess thinking about the question of, mm -hmm. I mean, we have subtitled it, the Negro National Anthem or the Black National Anthem, but certainly <laughs> um, that wasn't a part of the, the original wording. Um, so do you have thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, I think there are um, still African-Americans who, who call it the Negro National Anthem, right? And so um, for them, um, you know, it is about a particular sort of um, uh, place and history and historical moment. Um, but I don't, um, yeah, I don't, it's, you know, Negro National Anthem, Black National Anthem, I think are all sort of kind of colloquial terms that African Americans have used for lift every voice and sing. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful song. It, it's a song that's more appropriate for a national anthem, to be honest. But I, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. certainly, certainly, the discussion of kind of replacing, you know, our current national anthem in terms of the U.S. with something else, right? Um, Lift every voice and sing would certainly uh, rank at the top of my list. Uh, yeah. America the Beautiful is also a nice song. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about kind of digital humanities, and I wonder for a second if you could just talk about, in the simplest terms possible, how you would define digital humanities. Um, I've invited a few of my students from my Introduction to English uh -huh. Studies course, mm -hmm. and in our third unit, we'll be talking about the intersection between text and textual, you know, technology and textuality, right? You know, words and um, you know, binary code and so forth. When you say digital humanities, um, what does that mean to you? I mean, I think we've seen kind of an example of it clearly mm -hmm. in your project, but what does yeah, that mean? I think for me, it means that, and we always do this, we start with, um, with a question and we start with a humanities-based question. Um, for me, and, and when I, you know, I teach um, my students and my students do digital projects, and I always tell them the question comes first, the conversation comes first, right? And so digital humanities um, is, a, um, it is a perspective, it is the use of tools, it's an engagement with tools, it's an engagement with ideas around technologies and their implications um, for the kind of work that we do in the humanities. So, um, in terms of you know so so yes yeah, so it is um it is the it is several things right um i i don't want folks to get sort of run off or scared or intimidated by thinking that they have to be programmers um in order to do this kind of work right um so i think there are lots of ways that you can engage with digital humanities at the level of questioning, right? At the level of thinking about our engagements and interactions and intersections with technologies. Um, and so, so yeah, so rather than give you sort of like digital humanities is X, Y, Z, right? Um, it's really about um, the questions that we have 
um, as scholars of, you know, the humanities and the ways that, in which we're thinking through with, against, and about technologies and its implications and relationships with the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love that, right? So, so the question comes first, right? The, the kind of humanities-based question comes first, right? Why do people love this song? Why, why, it has, you know, why has it lasted for all this time? What does it right. look like now? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. So thinking about your, your archive, what's the, the, the next step? I know that you've talked about um, in the actual site itself about kind of examining comments or um, what you kind of call the metadata, kind of what comes after. So talk about, yeah. if you could, just a little bit about kind of what do you see um, as the kind of next stage of singing the nation into being. Yeah, so that's that's the next stage. I want to think about, you know, the data about the data, right? <laughs> and so I, you know, so that's that's part of it. Um, but I also really want to do a memory project. So I feel like the third phase of it um, opens it up to people. Uh, to the public to say, so I want this to be more public facing to the public to say, um, share your memories, right, about Lift Every Voice and Sing. And so um, one of the reasons I say that it's the very first time I presented on the project when it was in another form, uh, when we got to the Q&A, most of the questions were actually people raising their hands to say, I remember when I sang this in church, or I remember when we sang this here, and it was a, it was a really sort of important moment for me because I had not realized until then, sort of the meaning that the song held for so many people, and, and it was across sort of racial lines as well, right? So that was really interesting to have like white people get up in an audience and say, "I remember singing this and like Outward Bound," and I remember singing this here, and you know we used to roast mar roast, roast marshmallows, and you know so it was it clearly like the song has another life that is outside of the context of black life as well that we that we can think about right so the song appeared in church hymnals for example and so what did it mean what does it mean that there are people who are not black who encounter the song in church and don't necessarily or didn't necessarily have the uh, have an idea of the sort of the context, right, of it as a Black national anthem, right, mm. who only know, know it as lift every voice and sing. And I think accounting for that is, is, is impossible, which makes the joy of the project so real, right, that you can't account for where it's going to be sung next, right. who's going to kind of hum it, you know, hum it in a certain space, a certain place, um, which is really wonderful. Um, I really want to kind of open the floor up now to folks who might have questions, right? And you can either, again, you can put your question um, in the Q&A tab, you can use the chat feature, or you can also raise your hand and we can um, call on you. Um, Dr. Donson has given us a lot to think about, so I'm, I'm happy to, to um, open it up for, for questions. Um, and so I see one question at the very bottom of the chat. Um, from Deborah Jones, and it asks, can you share your thoughts on the impact this song would make if sung by a multiracial choir? Um, so the, the song has actually been sung by many, many people, including, you know, for thinking about, um, uh, there, there are a couple of performances of children's choirs, for example, that are, that are multiracial. The, um, uh, what is it, the, uh, the um, uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir has also performed it in a performance that was about uh, a reconciliation. Um, so the NAACP participated um, in, in that um, uh, reconciliation program with the, with, the, with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So there, there have been many, many, many different people performing the song over the years. The song has been performed by black choirs overseas um, uh, as well. Some of my favorites are actually the children's choirs when they perform. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's been, yeah, that's, that's part of the, uh, the history of the song's performance as well. Yeah. 
And I think at the heart, maybe like another question behind that question might also be a question of like who owns the song, right? I mean, I think when I see the words multiracial choir, it's kind of like, well, do white folks have the right, <laughs> right to kind of sing and kind of, you know, receive something from the song, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think that's also what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. um, a question that I was posed actually um, before our conversation tonight was, um, is the song copyrighted? I'm assuming it's not because I see it all over and sung by so many, but do you, do you have a sense of kind of the legal status um, of the song and, and what that might mean in terms of? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, what's the length of the, what's the length of the copyright according to? Yeah, I mean. Actually, it might be. It might be out of copyright yeah. protection. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, my sense it would be that, you know, given its kind of origin that at this point it's in the public domain. Yeah. Um, but the question of ownership, of course, is not a legal question. That's more a question of kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, is it mine? Is it yours? Who can yeah. play this I game? Mean, I, and I think the early history of the song, you know, moving from poem to song uh, in terms of moving from, you know, something to commemorate Lincoln's birthday, Mm -hmm. um the the emphasis on circulation by uh both johnson and his, in his you know and his publishers um i think meant that the song was always going to be one that was not necessarily hmm i don't want to say that 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 would be in circulation in different in spaces outside of black um communal spaces right mm -hmm. and so whether um, uh, those who are not black are singing it recognize or understand that it's also the black national anthem. Uh, so many people I talked to weren't aware that it was the black national anthem. They knew it as lift every voice and sing and they sang it in church. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. And I see um, a comment from, this is Professor Kendra Boyd. Yeah. Um, welcome to the conversation, not, not a, question but comment on um, professor of history at Rutgers Camden and she writes that the poem would be out of copyright by now yeah. anything from 1925 or earlier is out of copyright which makes makes sense to me as well, mm -hmm. well that's that's also good news for folks who do mashups right and <laughs> sort of um uh play with the uh the song or sort of remake the song in 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 different ways so yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, and I think that also connects to your point then about your appreciation for the mashups as well. I mean, I think particularly about, I'm not sure if folks have seen this version, but you can go to Dr. Donaldson's archive and look at Kim, Kim Weston's um, performance, right, of Lift Her Voice and Sing. And in that particular rendition, you have her singing the song, which is my kind of favorite lyrical version of it in terms of her song choices, her tone is, is just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. But then the song uh, visually, right? They're at kind of you know a stadium. It's it's um, it's a, a song you know co a conference which kind of benefits um, folks in the '60s, and you can see her singing. But then at a certain point, the video cuts from her face and Jesse Jackson with his big afro in the background, and yeah. people in the crowd kind of putting up their black fists and, and getting hype. Then it cuts to this kind of um, pictorial narrative, right? That you were mentioning earlier. And you mm -hmm. see images of people, you know, um, who are, have been, you know, victims of racial hate. You know, you see people who have been lynched. You see all these kind of graphic images, mm -hmm. and they're all kind of overlaying the songs. And so that really transforms the song in a way that not just simply the sound of it, right? The actual images make the song a different type of song. Um, are there other mashups that kind of stand out to you in terms of ones which are memorable or ones which kind of really take the song in directions, which I think are really interesting. Um, yeah, so there is the, there's the Mackenzie Patton, which is actually a recitation. I think that was part of um, a high school competition or uh, uh, yeah, it was part of a, a sort of oratorical um, competition. Um, so that's really interesting because it's a, it's a recitation but they're using images from the civil rights movement. Um, and you see quite a, quite a bit of that. So it begins with you know, Martin Luther King and the March on Washington and um, 
images of sort of black children in a rural context. So I think that that one also um, uh, was sort of really interesting and resonant with me uh, for uh, for me in terms of thinking about how people are narrativizing uh, black experiences through the lens of this song, right? And then I forget which one it was, they're actually sort of matched up the lyrics to particular visual moments. If I can, if I can, if I can drag that up, um, I'll have to come back because I don't remember it right now. Um, but yeah, so there's a very sort of, there's an intentionality about the ways that folks are creating these these videos, and I think it's also this is why I also included the um, the the narrative um, uh, of uh, uh, you know there's like a short narrative about um, each, but in some of the notes, which I guess you you know you don't have on the page, the notes also that the the video creators um, um, upload also tell us a story, you know, like, oh, it took me eight hours to do this and I couldn't get this to work. So that's also for me really important and a part of, you know, that process of um, creation, right? So it wasn't, again, I think for so long, um, videos in YouTube, especially the sort of, um, the way that the ease of use sort of engendered, you know, um, um, or fostered this um, sort of individual um, creativity was also kind of seen as, as a sort of, well, they're not quality um, or they don't have a particular value necessarily because it's just some random kid in his grandmother's bathroom singing lift every voice and thing. But what happens if we actually sort of put it in the context of, you know, there's a narrative where this young person says, um, you know, my grandmother taught me to sing this song and from her Songs of Zion book, right? And so they are actually creating the meaning. I mean, they are creating the archive, right? Because it's not just that someone has thrown up a video, they're actually telling you a story about uh, intergenerational relationships and memory, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's really, really important. So once I started to look through sort of closer and not just sort of someone performing, but also to think about what is the story that they're telling? What are they incorporating in their mashups, right? They're telling us something about their own relationship to blackness and to nation um, that I think is really important um, to recognize, um, you know, in, a collection or any other way so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we've been talking about kind of collaboration in terms of how you know the poem becomes a song and the song you know gets music and, and all these kind of various features of it and so it makes total sense that even now in the most kind of contemporary versions of it people are kind of working together to kind of take the song and kind of add images um, and also kind of in a very dem democratic way I mean despite the kind of corporate nature of kind of Google and YouTube, I mean, what it also does allow, if you can kind of jump over the digital divide, right, is to kind of um, kind of make it your own, right? And so I think the democratic nature of, um, you know, possibilities of the web is something which kind of really works nicely with, it would seem, lift mm -hmm. our voice and sing, because this is a song which yeah. is about community and collaboration. Yeah. yeah, there's something, I mean, just to go back to the comment section and why I was so interested in, in, in this. So I used to read comment sections for a lot of things that were not healthy, um, but the YouTube's comments, comment sections um, are special. And sometimes, sometimes it's not a nice place, but sometimes there are these gifts and so, for example, when I see a video of a young person performing and I look, I read the comment section and most often people are um, complimentary. Um, and so they offer loving critique. Um, they share information, right? So part of the reason that I know what a Roland Carter 
arrangement is, is because I read the comment section on, on performances and they'll say, oh, that's a Roland Carter, you know, arrangement. I remember when I was in this choir, you know, in 1992 and we performed here and it's, it's the comments actually open up an entire sort of historical world, right? Um, uh, to us that wasn't necessarily available or wouldn't necessarily be available um, if we weren't attending to that. So the, you know, um, I, I, I definitely shifted my thinking in terms of how I looked at both the space YouTube in terms of the, um, the videos that appeared there and, you know, what happens below that sort of video line um, that, you know, typically doesn't really get um, taken up with any sort of seriousness, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, it kind of also kind of just blends with the call and response, which is typical, right? Characteristic yeah. of, yeah. you know, um, African American cultural production. So yeah. um, it makes total sense to kind of go right in, in that direction. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of your work and your time. Um, I'd like to just kind of open it up for any last final questions for, for Dr. Donaldson. We are at the, well, two minutes over the 7.30 um, oh. marker. Um, my time flies when you're having a good conversation. Um, but anybody else who might have a question or, or a comment for Dr. Donaldson, um, please do so now. Um, I also wanted to give you opportunity to kind of plug some things which are happening at New Jersey City University. I know we have um, a keynote coming up, a Black um, History Month keynote. You might want to say a bit about that, oh. as well as kind of other projects that you're that you're working on. Sure, we have uh, on Friday at uh, noon, we have Dr. Daryl Scott, who's a, a professor of history at uh, Howard University, who will be giving our Black History Month keynote. Um, and that kicks off um, with a series of, um, it, with a celebration afterwards. Um, we also are doing our, our Lovecraft Country conversations <laughs> on the 19th. And I think this time around, we're probably going to be looking at um, the American GI in, uh, in South Korea. Um, mm. Think about um, that part of history. Um, there are lots of other things happening um, that I'm sure I'm forgetting, but there is a calendar. <laughs> a handy calendar um, that um, we can um, post, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, this year we've been working hard to kind of think about um, the ways that we can partner together, not simply kind of yeah. have our separate programs. And so right. we're very happy to support the programming at um, NJCU. And we thank you so much for being here um, this you. evening. I see lots of comments coming up in the um, chat box, um, thanking you for being here, for sharing your expertise and knowledge. And so we're so thankful um, to have you here. And I encourage you all to check out the archive. Um, it's singingthenation.com, right? Is that, is that correct? Yes, right. singingthenation.com. Yeah, so check out the archive and then you can follow up with questions um, to Dr. Donaldson um, directly. I wanna thank also all of you for being here. I see lots of folks um, from, um, um, Longside Historical Society. I see folks from Ghanaian Association of South Jersey. I see folks um, just from our church family, from um, just all over the place who've just come. Um, NAACP, of course, um, re well represented here in Rutgers Camden. So thank you all for being here this evening. Um, it's been such a fruitful discussion and we look forward to seeing you at other events that will take place um, throughout the month. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.